Hey everybody, I'm back. So, I uh, just came back from up in Washington State uh, doing some doing some family matters uh, with my father-in-law's uh, memorial service. So it was a long and fruitful weekend. Uh, kind of busy and kind of tired right now. Just got back. Um, it was a pretty whirlwind kind of tour. Um, very large family and Lots of people wanting to know all kinds of things about everybody's history, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, just so, what I thought I'd do tonight is do just one more state. We've got Rhode Island here, and in Rhode Island, we have a question that comes up, which is, uh, you know, is there gold in Rhode Island? Well, not much, but you, there's also not much in the way of other stuff. But there is a place that has rare earth elements and some some. Uh, uh, nuclear kind of material, uh, uranium and thorium. Uh, so I thought it'd be interesting just to kind of poke around a little bit and make it a short and sweet night. Um, kind of, like I said, I'm kind of tired from all the flying today. So, uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's have at it. Um, is, uh, check to see everybody's on. I'm going to do a audio check, make sure we're working. Uh, had all the equipment down for the, for the, I use the camera for other purposes. I've got some pretty cool pictures of river I wanted to share with you guys a little later um, and some volcano, vol, volcano volcano pictures from the airplane it was pretty cool up the Cascades so let's take a look at uh, what's going on in Rhode Island we've got uh, six comments already and and uh, a handful of people online uh, Justin's there and uh, yep things like that are not always easy Justin yep I agree uh, uh, the the beauty of this was that uh, Bob that was his name he's my father-in-law and it, to be honest with you nobody could ever wish for a better father figure in your life than this guy uh, he lived into his 90s he was part of that you know the the ultimate generation that gave their everything in World War II including you know he got shot and uh, and uh, ended up uh, fighting through and overcoming that hurdle and, and uh, heading from, that was in Germany and headed off to Japan for the other end of the war and uh, ended up re helping rebuild Japan after the war and uh, his expertise became in electronics, which he leveraged into where I get a lot of my background for engineering was his influence on my life because he showed me the the curious thing that is geoengineering, uh, he worked for a company called Schlumberger and they do downwell logging for the oil industry throughout the West. In fact, he worked all over the world, but it, it was an interesting eye opener to me to see geophysics in action. This is where you use electronics and electromagnetic fields, use radiation, use just anything you can to figure out what, how much oil is down there, what levels it's at, and what you're going to have to do to recover it. And that's where a lot of the new recovery methods you see came from the engineering work that was done back then, as well as just finding how big the oil fields are or are not in various places in the world. So, um, very cool. Okay, so our, our audio is good. And uh, we're looking at uh, gold and so forth. So, and I am thankful. Thank you. Uh, thankful for you guys, uh, Justin. Thanks for your comment about his service. Uh, you know, Purple Heart. My boys are are uh, in awe. You know, at this guy uh, have been since they were tiny ones. He was always, you know, in the shop with them, working on stuff, building things, showing them how electronic things work, and asking them questions about their lives that you know, gee, only a grandfather could do. So, uh, uh, a huge figure in my life and in others. And so to see. This uh, sending off that we had uh, up there was spectacular. You know, it's very, very close knit family, big family. And so it was fun to go and look, but I did not get one iota of a chance to do any prospecting. And I, I told everybody I'd put the pans down, <laughs> put the pans down because, you know, it was a moment for the family. And so, um, and I respected that. Um, and I know you guys would too. So here's the deal. So tonight, let's talk a little bit about gold and REE. -E. What's an REE? -E? It's a rare earth element, and it's the newfangled gold of the future. It's the thing that goes into your neodymium magnets. Uh, you'll see those super magnets you see all over the place and everything from speakers to cell phones. Uh, these guys are loaded with that kind of stuff. Uh, it's also used in the phosphors and so forth that are found inside your cell phone. Let me see if I can do this magic trick, <clears throat> including your cell phone's 
<clears throat> LED light systems, and all these LED lights you're seeing show up everywhere. They all depend on rare earth elements for the doping and for the phosphors that go into them that em uh, emit the lights. The lights that are typically produced are in the ultraviolet range, and they get converted by some special phosphorescent properties that allow them to emit light in ranges that don't blind us as much. Uh, they do emit a little on the high end of blue, which is not necessarily as good for your eyes as, as was once thought. And so uh, with all that in mind, it's the new gold. Uh, and what's starting to happen is because of the competition for this material throughout the world and because of the huge explosion in these techno whiz bang toys that we have, cell phones included, uh, we have a, a, a kind of a supply and demand problem that's developing that's going to mean the demand goes up, supply goes down, price goes up. That's something that you need to be in, have an eye open for. And since our EEs are related to things that you find with gold, like uranium and thorium and tellurium, you kind of want to keep your eyes open for uh, areas that have those kinds of properties have once produced gold. They may also have in their tailings piles significant amounts of these rare earths, but also back in the mine that those tailings came from may not have any more gold in it, but it may be loaded with rare earths. So it turns out they're the hot ticket right now for, for uh, geologic prospectors throughout the world. So let's take a look at what we've got there. Um, so I did a little little sleuthing and I found that, you know, there isn't a whole lot of gold here in Rhode Island. Uh, you can find, you know, virtually all of it right here in this one spot called the Durfee Mine. Uh, let's zoom in on that guy. And we'll see that immediately it's just a couple of mines uh, in this area, one area of Rhode Island. And uh, it, it had uh, been a past producer of gold and had some molybdenum. Remember, we talked about various associated metals. Well, that's one of them. Uh, same thing here, gold and silver, okay? And so uh, how, how far back we do our little magic trick? We look to see how far back it goes. And this is a 1999 of 1980. So relatively recent uh, record here we have. Uh, doesn't indicate that anybody's mining it currently. But the primary commodity was gold, and it had some tertiary silver, which means that it was a rich, probably a rich electrum or a rich gold with, you know, some level of, of uh, mix of silver in it. That's not uncommon. Uh, somebody asked me on the web uh, this weekend, sent a really nice picture. Uh, hopefully I can, you know, we can find out a little bit more about the picture and what we're looking at. But it looked to me a little bit like it might be electrum. The question that they asked was, well, I see this brassy looking stuff, which I assume is a pyrite. It may not be, it may be crystalline gold. But with it is this other stuff that's kind of a bluish silvery tone. Hmm. Well, when you look at that, sometimes you'll see a brassy looking thing or you'll see something that's like crystals of gold and crystals of silver or bluish silver. That can be a, a an electrum mix, in which case there's gold in with the silver. So it tends to keep it from you know, corroding to the black that it normally would as easily. But the fact is it's going to be a silvery tone and not gold. That doesn't mean it doesn't have gold in it. And obviously in their case, there are spots that were pretty golden looking. So the real question is, okay, what's the cleavage? You know, you go through your rock analysis. What's the cleavage? Does it, does it have any kind of uh, ductility? Can you take it with the head of a pin and a magnifying glass and look and scrape on it and see if it scratches the surface or does it chip away like a little crystal or like a mica where it comes off in plates or flakes? And that's the quickest, fastest way to look at those things from a pyrite point of view and say, well, is this pyrite? Is it mica? Or is this something metallic that's soft like gold or electrum? Because electrum will be harder than gold. That's the way the silver mixes in but it will not be very hard. It'll be more like lead. And you know how you can scrape lead if you take a, you know, like a lead uh, sinker and you scrape it. Well, it'll have that property where it leaves a little curved edge where you scrape, as opposed to leaving little chips or sh shards as it, as it breaks the crystals away. That's one telltale look uh, test that you want to do. Even if you can't get in there and do a, a streak test to see if it is a brown or, or black streak, you can at least look to see what it appears to do under the magnifying glass look at the crystals and see if they break away. So that's a real quick one on tonight. Uh, so let's go back to Google Earth. 
Now let's zoom out a bit. That's the sum total of the two gold mines in Rhode Island. Well, that's disappointing. So then I said, well, what about other stuff? You know, using our technique of looking for other related or associated materials. And I found a couple of things that are kind of interesting. There's some iron mines over here in this area. And, and they have uh, associated with them iron and titanium. Now, titanium can also go with gold a little bit. Uh, and so can iron under the right circumstances. It doesn't look like that's what's going on here, but I thought it was kind of interesting that they were finding titanium in this area. Again, it's only two locations. It does give, uh, uh, let's see, the, the USGS bulletin in 1964, and then there's 1974 here. So, you know, relatively recent work, but uh, pretty sparse information on exactly what they were finding. And it doesn't look like, you know, it looks like surface deposits, so it's some kind of a, some kind of a placer uh, mine. Uh, not clear exactly what or where or how they're pulling it. Uh, it does kind of almost look like, you know, in one case they may have used this area to pull out some metals and, and process them. But uh, again, it's, it's just hard to tell. You'd have to go and do a little more research on, you know, what's this facility? Is it is it some kind of research plant for something entirely different or is it related to doing some kind of mining? Just don't know. Uh, here's the here's another one that's kind of fun that I thought I'd bring up, and that's this Foster Prospect. Out in the middle of nowhere is this one prospect that, lo and behold, has arsenic, uranium. Now, arsenic goes with gold, can. Uranium, that can go with gold as well. Th thorium, hmm, interesting. And REEs, rare earth elements. So right here is one package that kind of has some properties like gold that is of interest in terms of metals that are in, have a, a huge industrial use, especially those REEs and possibly thorium in the, in the sense of, of its potential use for a future power source. Uranium possibly, although we're selling all that to, yeah, never mind. <laughs> Here we go, politics again. Uh, so uh, 1962, uh, Euro, U.S. BM uh, uh, Minerals, so some kind of a Bureau of Mines Minerals report had this information in it, and uh, that that was the nature of it. Um, they don't say surface or anything else, just says that this is a, a location that was noted for having this material. You'd want to look in the geology for this area and do more research on that, look at claims and ownership, because this is looks like it's out in the middle of the forest, but chances are it belongs to whoever owns this or can or, you know, and so you have to work that out. That's true of anything you find with these maps, but nonetheless, it's an interesting thing that there are rare earths here and they do exist in areas like the titanium does and the gold in areas that you just wouldn't necessarily associate with much gold <clears throat> like we see here in Rhode Island. And so that's our quick, quick uh, discussion of the night. Uh, considering Rhode Island's fairly small area, that's kind of significant, and especially tying it in with Massachusetts and the things we found there and so forth. You want to kind of get the different states and lock and put them together. Again, uh, look at the government gold maps thing, uh, GGM, sourdoughminer.com, GGM. That explains this process of, you know, finding these locations, what you're looking for, why you want to try different metals and what you do to make the maps so that you can see the metals separate from one another and see them at the same time to kind of get a feel for where is there a trend line, if any. Now, in this particular case, I don't see much of a trend line. It's not something I would jump up and down. And I, I might do some research if I lived near there just because I'd be kind of curious about this Durfee Hill mine. There might be some history. There might even be, in some cases, these older mines like this that are in places that have populations they have little tourist ventures of their own and they'll run a little panning thing or something but you just don't know uh, so the best way to find out is contact them you know reach out and uh and try it uh be nice surprising how far being nice goes especially when it comes to gold um you know all we need to do is be a little obnoxious and we get everybody jumping all over us so let's not be let's be nice so that's kind of it for tonight uh touch bases with you real quick here check to see if i missed something and then I think I'll call it quits for the evening. Kind of tired, traveling. And let's see, Scott says, you're awesome. Hey, thanks. Uh, and let's see, uh, Brad Steven is Texas watching. Great, okay, so I think we've touched bases. Uh, we've got oh, a bunch of people here, that's great. Um, 
So I'll catch you tomorrow night when I get my bearings back, uh, get back online. We'll be talking more and more. We're gonna, you know, we're kind of wrapping up the few states in the east here. I think we pretty much finished all of them now. And now we're going to spin over and, and spend some time talking about the the geomorphology of glaciers and what that did to gold. Because really a big part of the story that we have in the Midwest, you know, Nebraska, Ohio, uh, we talked a little bit about um, Illinois already. And and so when you're moving from there down through Missouri and heading heading to Louisiana, you're talking about the the leftovers of a lot of glaciation. And we'll talk about that in a kind of maybe a broader spectrum picture because it applies throughout the region and talking about one specific state, you know, we could probably do a better job of just talking about what's not in those states and then talk about how to, how to find gold there anyway, because you can. And that'll be for the next uh, couple of uh, periods here. We're also going to go back to discuss what we've been asked about, which is rocks and minerals, and uh, talk a little bit more about that. And so I will catch you tomorrow night. Good prospecting and good night. Prospector Jess, over and out. And don't forget, Government Gold Maps, check it out. And I'll catch you then. Bye-bye.